Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest Hump Day Hangout. Steve Pegram, your host of the first Wednesday of the month Hump Day Hangout on Fire Engineering, which focuses on training. Uh, I'm the president of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors and also fire chief here in Goshen, Ohio. And uh, this week, uh, or this month on the Hump Day Hangout, we're going to be talking about the Fire Engineering ISFSI George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award. Uh, applications or nominations for that award uh, are open now, so we'll be talking a little bit about that award, uh, what it means, and also uh, our guests today are three of the most recent uh, Instructor of the Year award winners. Um, so we felt who better to talk about the award, what the award meant to them, and what it means to be an excellent instructor and somebody worthy of being nominated than the past three award winners that got the award at FDIC the past three years. So before we uh, go into that, just a little update uh, on some other stuff. Obviously, FDIC 2017 coming up April 24th through the 29th, uh, 2017. That is where we give out the Instructor of the Year Award, and uh, it's important that people put in some nominations. We Every year we struggle a little bit sometimes uh, to get nominations on different awards that are given out at FDIC. We all know people that are excellent instructors. Uh, they also give out the uh, Valor Award at FDIC, and um, those nominations are open now, too. So if you know of somebody that fits the bill, we encourage you to go to Fire Engineering's website, go to ISFSI's website, isfsi.org. You can download the uh, nomination form, which is just one page. Send it in to us before December 31st, and that nomination will get reviewed by a panel of people that make the selection and the award is given at FDIC. As always, when you're listening to the Hump Day Hangout, if you have a question you'd like to ask the panel, uh, please feel free to do so by uh, on Twitter using the hashtag FE Talk. Again, hashtag FE for Fire Engineering Talk, and we'll be monitoring Twitter and uh, we'll chime in with any of those questions that we might receive from the audience. So normally, uh, our co-hosts, Aaron Heller and Brad French would be on here with me today, uh, but both Aaron and Brad are uh, doing training today, which is fitting being that this is a training hump day hangout, um, but they're not able to be with us, and Bobby Halton is also traveling, um, so you're stuck with me for the whole hour and our, uh, and our guests. So with that said, we'll go to our panel of guests. I'll allow each one of them to introduce themselves and uh, you know maybe briefly tell us about how it felt when you got that phone call. Uh, letting you know that you were receiving the Instructor of the Award, Year Award. Eddie, let's start with you. Well, hey, gang. It's Eddie Buchanan. I'm Assistant Chief for Hanover Fire and EMS. We're near Richmond, Virginia. Um, it's, it, that phone call you're talking about is pretty bizarre. I was actually sitting on an airplane and um, getting ready to go out. Who knows where, right? And uh, the phone rings, and I see that it was, I think it was Bobby's uh, caller ID that was on there. And I get on the phone, and uh, you know, he goes, "Hey, what are you doing?" You know, typical Bobby stuff. And and then he goes, "I'm on the phone with Steve Pegram," and I immediately knew what that meant, right? Because being a past president, I knew the drill. So I was like, "You have got to be." First off, can you even do that? Can we do this? You know, but uh, it's a remarkable um, honor to be the instructor of the year. Um, I, I would liken it a little bit to like uh, the equivalent of winning an Emmy or a Grammy or something, because it. it kind of goes in your bio and stays with you, you know, for forever and ever. And uh, it's, it's really a cool honor to have that. And uh, I, I really, I was completely shocked that, uh, that you know, my name came up. It was pretty, pretty tremendous honor. So thanks for having me on the show today. It's good to be here. Hey, everybody. Awesome. Mr. Kerber. I think you're muted. Try that again. Steve Kerber, I'm the director of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. And uh, I mean, th thinking back to that phone call, I mean, it, much like Eddie said, very surreal, uh, very humbling. Um, I think back to, I think it was, it was 2009 or so, somewhere in that ballpark, um, sitting in the audience watching Dan Madrakowski get it. And uh, just, just being in awe of that and uh, thinking that. I mean, we really don't think of ourselves as as trainers in the the typical sense, and uh, it's uh, amazing honor. And 
I mean, my, my dad runs a fire training academy, and I, I immediately started thinking of all of the guys that really just grunt it out every day. The people that I think of when I think of fire service instructors um, that are there for very low wages, that are working their butts off to make sure that student after student comes through that place and gets the best experience possible. And uh, the, the ability that we have to try and help those people out, I guess, is, uh, is what got me nominated and what got me the award. But um, I really have a lot of respect for those folks as well. Awesome. Well said. Mr. Van Doer. Sir. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Pete Van Dorp. I'm the chief in the Lincoln Hills Fire Protection District, and uh, I was last year's recipient. And I very similar experience to Steve and Eddie both. You know, I, uh, but I got a bit of a heads up on mine because I got the phone call. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Pete. This is Bobby. I got Steve Pegram with me on the phone, and then click, we lost the connection. So. You know, I, I had a moment to think about, okay, why are these two guys calling me and what's up with this? And then just because of the time of year and all that kind of stuff, you figure out, oh, my God, why? And then, of course, you know, it's the how come me and what are you thinking and, you know, who, who fell asleep at the switch and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's an honor. There's no doubt about that, and you're grateful for that. Uh, it's also scary, and it's also a burden in some ways. Um, because now you got to live up to this thing, and and I think actually that's you know uh, we were talking before we got on about talking about what the benefit of it is, and really the benefit is it's like being an instructor. I think we all remember when we first taught, and you realized, oh, well, now I really got to know what I'm talking about, right? So you go back into the books, and you you, you don't want to make a fool of yourself, and you don't want to make a, the, a fool of the people that gave you the opportunity or gave you the opening, right? Uh, so you up your game. You got to have your A game all the time. And of course, I include this on my bio now. Who wouldn't? And uh, so it gets read when people are introducing me. I'm teaching a class. It gets read, and I go, "Oh yeah, I've got to live up to that now." Um, and I'm I'm glad for that because it, it it reminds me that that I don't speak for me. I I speak for the fire service in some sense. And so I've got an obligation to Steve and Dan and Eddie and all these people that that put their faith in me. I got to live up to that. Uh, so it, it helps. It helps me as an instructor, and um, that if if there's a benefit to it, I think that that's the benefit is that it, it you know it reminds you of what your obligations are and, and sort of like a motivation to uh, always be on your A game. Absolutely, I think all three of you uh, summarized that pretty well, and probably part of the reason why all three of you are past award winners. Eddie, if you would, the uh, Instructor of the Year Award is named after a guy named George D. Post. Tell us a little bit about the background of that. So George D. Post uh, was a cartoonist for the FDNY uh, way back in the 60s, you know. And you have to think about, to really appreciate the contributions that, that Post made to the fire service, understand the technology of the time, right? So you... You, you couldn't just go out on the internet and snag a picture and put it in your slideshow. All the training materials were developed from by hand. You know, you, you needed a, literally an artist uh, to sit down and, and create these uh, assets, we call them, that we put in our training programs these days. So uh, Post was one of the original pioneers of this to, to, to look and see what can we, you know, if, there, if you can't necessarily just import a picture, what, what can be done to uh, provide the training resources. And I was, you know, I was thinking, what would be a modern version of that? You know, it's kind of like a like the impact look like Paul Combs has now uh, with, with what he can do from an educational perspective uh, with, with art. And, and it's very powerful, the stuff that he put, that he does. It's amazing. And Post is kind of the precursor to that, you know, back in the 60s. And uh, it's, it's almost ironic that that's, only, that's really the two, right, They're, that come to mind. There's Post, there's uh, Combs. And... Uh, and then the rest of us are just trying to figure out how to how, how to crop a photo or whatever. But he had a tremendous uh, a tremendous impact on how training kind of spun up from the '60s and and how to use visual art or visual aids uh, in a training environment. So that that's kind of where that came from. And uh, the early awards uh, were, were named you know named after him. And he was around to give a couple of the of the of the first ones. I've got a, somewhere there's a photo in the ISFSI archives. Of him presenting the first uh, instructor of the year award himself, so it's it's really, um, you know, to carry that name is pretty much a it's a big honor 
you know. So looking at, at people that had tremendous impacts in training, and then when you go through and look at the uh, the list of, of award winners, the on the ISFSI website there's a list, a chronological list of all the winners. And it's still I'm, I'm still I'm not sure how I ended up in there, but it's an honor to be there. Absolutely, and I think it's interesting and kind of unique, or makes the the award unique, is that the the first award winner or the person that's named after uh, was an illustrator, you know, somebody who contributed heavily to uh, training materials and things like that, but wasn't necessarily somebody that was out there teaching classes and uh, standing in front of a classroom like we would think of a traditional instructor. And with that said, I, you know, when we're thinking about somebody to nominate for this award. Um, it's okay to go a little bit outside the box and not think right off the top of your head of someone that is, you know, that nationally known speaker. Um, it could be somebody local, regional, or has an impact in training and education of firefighters in a different way. We're looking for you, the listeners, to send in those nominations and let us know what makes those people unique. So I just wanted to cover real quick um, some of the criteria for the award. Uh, if, you, if anybody out there is thinking about nominating somebody, and then I've got some more follow-up questions for our panel. But the uh, George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award is given to someone who has displayed a deep commitment for furthering the cause of the fire service through training. Pretty obvious there. We'll have advanced uh, firefighter operational effectiveness and safety, gone above and beyond the call of duty in the realm of training, brought creativity and innovation to a fire training program, and been a positive role model for fire instructors and firefighters throughout the country. I think that sums it up pretty well. Um, but as we go into some additional follow-up questions, you know, as we're, we're looking at people, uh, helping people make the decision who to nominate or somebody to nominate, I'd like to ask each of you, what trait do you think makes up a great instructor? So whether it be yourself, somebody who has trained you, or when you're training or mentoring up-and-coming instructors, uh, what is it that traits that you really look for those people to have those uh, skills and abilities as an instructor that you think makes them great? And any one of you wants to chime in first. Well, I, I'll, I'll go first, and I'll tie it back to uh, what Eddie told us about George D. Post. And I think it's the firefighters are incredibly visual learners, <clears throat> and you have to find a way to take advantage of that. And uh, there's many great instructors out there that are using unbelievably creative ways to get the right messages in place, to, to leverage the firefighters' um, desire to see what's happening in front of them, to be hands-on, and to take that information that they need to learn and deliver it in a way that is, that is interesting, that's understandable, and that's something that, from the research standpoint, we struggle with all the time, is how do, how do you take something that's so complex as fire dynamics and not dumb it down? Because firefighters are smart. We don't want to be dumbing down anything. How do we simplify it, and how do we allow it to be visualized in such a way that the message gets across, and it's, it's memorable, it sticks, uh, it changes behavior, uh, things along those lines. So I think the, uh, the next George D. Post Instructor of the Year, uh, I think we'll be able to sit in that audience and, and look at that person saying that they, they've been very good at, at using visuals, at uh, getting that message across in a unique, powerful way. Well said, Steve. Eddie or Pete? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think um, we, we all know good instructors, and we all know great instructors, and I think the... If you had a, if I had to pick one word, I would pick passion, um, and and not just for instructing, but for the job itself. Um, you know, if if he if he didn't work for me, I'd be nominating my training officer this year. You know, I just think I, given that I'm on the panel for the review, I can't quite you know it wouldn't be right to do it, but he'll get nominated, and he'll get nominated eventually by me, uh, because he has a passion not just for instructing, but for the job. I mean, he's he's the guy. He's out there putting radios in our new apparatus. Uh, in between all the other things that he does, and he's in the AFFI Honor Guard, and he's uh, the union president, and you know he's just got a passion for every aspect of the job, and it shows in his instruction. Right, that that's part of what sets him apart from the guy that is just a subject matter expert. Uh, and I really think you know when you look around, if you're looking for that guy to nominate, 
it's that guy that, you know, maybe he's not known for being the greatest instructor in the world, but he's known for being very passionate about the job as a whole, and I think that has a great impact on how effective he is as an instructor. I think passion is key. Eddie, how about you? Yeah, I always think of uh, the, the word impact, you know, that, that uh, I kind of like Pete, where our, one of our, you know, our, we have a great instructional staff. We just rotated one of our guys out to the field because he got promoted. And uh, looking at that, you know, using that as kind of an example, uh, that guy has tremendous impact. And he has it in a wide variety of ways. He, not only does he does a great job teaching the technical aspects of firefighting, but he teaches uh, our recruits how to how to think and feel like a firefighter. Like, you know, what, is, what does it mean uh, in the heart and, and soul of a firefighter? He has a way of, of communicating that uh, th through example and through coaching and mentoring, you know. So you look at the impact that somebody like that can have. And, and, and for this award, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a national impact. It can be, it could be a local or regional impact. But for somebody who has the ability to move that needle uh, consistently, and, and I've always thought, you know, there's three learning domains, right? You know, cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. And if you want to get technical, that, that's kind of what we're talking about, somebody who, who's proficient in all three things. Most anybody can get the cognitive and psychomotor stuff straight. I mean, if you're, if you're a good instructor, you do that. But the great instructors reach out of that affective domain to really uh, teach people how to feel about things. You know, this is, how, this is what we feel about this certain topic we're talking about in the fire service and those those potential uh, folks to be nominated for this award can do all three. Very cool. So all, all of us at some point in our career um, were the student, obviously, and probably still are at times. Um, I'd like each of you to think a little bit about um, who was that instructor that really stood out for you in your career, whether it was an, somebody who trained you as an initial firefighter or maybe mentored you later in your career um, but, you know, who helped you to, and who do you emulate or try to emulate when you're, you're serving as an instructor? Um, and before I go to you guys on, on that question, um, I'll just bring mine up, which is a guy who um, isn't even active in the fire service anymore, was my first fire chief and uh, also taught my basic fire school class, a guy by the name of Phil Layton. And what made Phil unique was um, he was a Vietnam vet and had served in a very uh, active combat unit, uh, special forces, and there were a million rumors about Phil. And I, I'm guessing now as an adult that probably half of them weren't true, but because of all those rumors, nobody messed with him. He was that guy, and he was pretty much serious all the time. Um, every once in a while, he'd kind of crack a smile out of the corner of his mouth uh, or have a – every once in a while, you'd see him laugh, but he was pretty much – uh, pretty serious, but very much so what you guys are talking about. He had a huge impact on the fire service in the community I grew up in, as well as in the county and the region, and he had that passion that that, um, that Pete spoke about, having that passion as an instructor. And he was all business, all work, um, but made it fun, and but made us all realize as young, you know, 18, 19-year-old kids going through a basic firefighter training – that, yeah, you can have some fun and you can enjoy this and it can be uh, all those things and camaraderie and everything else, but it also could get you killed. And it was important, and he told some stories and, and gave real-life examples and his own personal experiences that made us every once in a while when we were laughing and yucking up and, and having a little too good of a time in training, he was very good at you know hitting that reset button and, and refocusing us on what was important and why it was important to learn the right way to do things. Um, and so he, he's somebody I haven't talked to in 20 plus years, but still an impact on who I am and, and how I am as an instructor and as a fire chief every day. Um, any of you want to chime in next? All right, I'll, I'll go. You're going to have to bear with me because I got three. I can't, I can't narrow it down to one. No problem. Um, first guy was Bob Jackson, and this is before I was in the fire service. Bob's not a firefighter. Uh, but in my youth, I was in a drum and bugle corps, and, and then I taught in a drum and bugle corps, and Bob taught me how to be an instructor. And, uh, and the, the lesson, the many lessons, but the one that always sticks with me is he said, if you're going to be a good instructor, one, you have to be convinced that you 
as an instructor are wholly responsible for their performance. And at the same time, you have to convince them that they are wholly responsible for their performance. And if you can pull that off, then you'll be successful, right? Everybody buys in 100%. Everybody takes responsibility. And that's always always stuck with me. Um, second guy would be Ray Hoff, which was a, a mentor of mine in many ways in the Chicago Fire Department. And I talked with Ray on a few occasions. And, and Ray, to Eddie's point, had this wonderful knack for blending in life into your performance in the fire service, on the fire ground, in the firehouse, as a leader, as an officer, as a firefighter. Uh, he just intuitively and naturally taught about how to think and live the way a firefighter should think and live. And that was his greatest strength as an instructor. And uh, that's, you know, I constantly try to... <laughs> um, and then probably the uh, the last guy would have been Eddie, Ed, Eddie Enright, which anybody who's even remotely associated with the fire service in Chicago or in Illinois knows who Eddie Enright is. And he is just the, the epitome of the gentleman. And uh, that, that part of his character where you know that he cares about you and, and what you think and who you are, um, every time I, I, I mean, I will hear, I will listen to him speak on any occasion, on any subject, at any time, because I just enjoy that part of him so much. So those three guys and those three big lessons uh, stick with me all the time. Absolutely. Eddie B? I would think uh, from an instructional standpoint, probably the, the, the one that had the most impact was uh, Rick Lasky. And had I not run into him when I did, I would would have never ventured off my ranch, right? You know, I was I was very content teaching at Hanover, had no aspirations to teach anywhere else. I thought maybe I might one day teach for the state or maybe uh, might make lieutenant one day or something. And that, that was really my – that's what I had the goals I had set out. And then I, I ran across him very early on, like at the very early saving our own days, you know. And uh, he literally uh, – didn't give me a lot of choice, man. It was like, you know, I want you to, I want you to write down this. We've got to talk about an article about what you're doing here. And, uh, you know, you know, bring an instructor in and he comes in and he says, yes, you should do all this great stuff. And then they get on the plane and leave. And then you can just think, well, that was the end of that. Right. So, uh, that did not happen. He, I figured that's what would happen, but that's not what happened. So like a week later I get a phone call. It's kind of right when email came out too. So, you know, you get on the phone and he goes, uh, I didn't see that article yet, man. You're going to, you're going to, you know, doing it, you're going to write that or what? And I, I was kind of like, I don't know, man. Who cares what we're doing, you know? And, and he goes, people want to know what you're, you're doing stuff that, that's, you know, it's unique. People want to know about it. So he kind of drug me a little reluctantly to the uh, something outside of my fire department. And, uh, and literally, I always tell people I can track the whole uh, career path I've taken all the way back to that conversation. You know, if, if, if he hadn't pushed me in the game, I probably would have never gotten in the game. And, uh, you know, it would, things would have been much different. So, uh, and I, I, kind of like Pete, I, I don't know if I can just name one or two, but um, another guy I was thinking about uh, is, is a guy named Mike Harmon, who's retired now. I, we have two Mike Harmons in our fire department, so it's kind of both of them are equally uh, had tremendous impact. But the one I'm thinking about was the one who was the volunteer chief when I was a cadet. I was 16 years old. And uh, didn't know anything about anything, really. And, uh, and he was the volunteer chief there. And uh, he doesn't know it, but, but the impact he had, the example he set, uh, you know, to really square things away. And things were a little nuts back in the early 80s in the volunteer fire service. You could get away with a lot of stuff that you can't do now. And, uh, and he, he kind of really always was that anchor of this is how you behave. This is what professionalism looks like. And... Uh, I, ironically enough, I, I still get to work with him because he's retired and he's working someplace else, and we still interact. So it's kind of cool uh, to still get to talk to him from time to time. But if I, I'll, I'll leave it at two. Those those two probably one one set me on a path uh, to not be a, a an idiot, <laughs> and then the other one uh, kicked me in the game, uh, you know, to to get me off my comfort out of my comfort zone and try to do a little more. Well, I think that's a great point, Eddie. And and for me, the the Rick Lasky in the room was you, who kind of, when I got involved with ISFSI, you kind of just grabbed me by the collar and said, follow me, and we'll, we'll, there's a plan, we'll let you know what the plan is later on, but follow me, and it was a cool experience to 
watch how the game is played and the show is done and how all this comes together. And um, so my appreciation to you for that. And obviously I know the relationship you had with Rick and, and uh, he's been a great mentor to me and several of us also. Mr. Kerber. Oh, I've, I've had the pleasure of being molded by many great instructors and uh, growing up in the fire service, I've been, I've been coached along the way, instructed along the way and, and pushed in the right direction by a lot of people. Um, back from the, the Broomall Fire Company, uh, all the, the people volunteering their nights to make sure that we knew what we were doing as very young kids, uh, up to the College Park Volunteer Fire Department where somewhat of a unique situation where you've got a department that serves a campus community, but the members are predominantly made up by college students. So you have, for the most part, a four-year rotation of membership and 20 plus students live in the firehouse and it's a heck of a task because you're constantly training this ever-evolving group of people that just keeps coming and coming and coming and uh, you also live with those folks um, so you're in a situation where you're living in the firehouse and I think back to to uh, coming off the streets from from a small suburban department coming into Prince George's County and the folks like uh, the leadership of Ty Dickerson, Fred Welsh, uh, the training that I got from your Troy Dannenfelsers, your Mike Mann, Tom Ruffini, Neil Russell, Ari Schloss, uh, all the folks that um, each taught me a different component. You had your, your truck trainers, your engine trainers, your EMS trainers because there was such a volume of folks coming through uh, there needed to be that specialization to, to take you through your rookie book and teach you really what you need to know. And uh, the best part of living with them is the instruction never stopped. Um, it was a constant learning, uh, living there and, and uh, riding calls, and it, it never turned off. The drills were nonstop, and the mentorship and the leadership and the instruction that they provided uh, certainly made I, who I am today uh, from a fire service standpoint. And then that continues through my professional career in, uh, in engineering. Uh, the Dan Madrikowskis, the Roy McLeans, Nelson Briners, the, the folks that um, truly go beyond the typical instructor, care about you personally, and want to see you succeed. And uh, that's the kind of person that, that we're looking for to give this award to. I think all three, four of us actually have, have mentioned different people and talked about those people and the impact they had on us. Um, I think one of the important points about this award is it doesn't have to be that known person, that person that immediately everybody's going to be familiar with. And, and all of us, all of you, just mentioned names of people that I've never heard of before. Some I did, obviously. Um, but those are the types of people that it doesn't have to be an Eddie Buchanan or a Steve Kerber or a Pete Van Dorp that wins the award. Um, we really want to seek out and find those people that are doing something unique, that have that passion, that are doing it, you know, nights and weekends and, and training when they don't even have to be doing training and, and uh, always setting the bar high. Um, and we know they're out there, but we need the listeners and the people that read the magazine and the members of ISFSI to take the time to jot down the information and fill out the application and send it into us. You know, people can't be recognized, they can't win if somebody doesn't nominate them. And I think that's really important that, you know, nominate somebody, um, regardless if you think they have a chance or not, let us make that decision. Um, yeah, we, we really need to have a stack of nominations of people that aren't on the national stage but deserve to be. Right. And that's what this thing can do for people. We we all know people like that. We all know people that this guy really belongs. You know, he needs a bigger stage. And how do we get that guy a bigger stage? This is one way to do it. Nominate him. Get him recognized. And then everybody like him gets recognized when he gets recognized. So it, it can be a very, very powerful thing to, to find the right guy that nobody knows about because he you're not just honoring him you're honoring everybody like him and you're you're causing all of us to to pay attention to the fact that the real work is getting done by people that we never hear about and we need to hear about it and everybody else needs to hear about it. Yep. so uh, he's not on here with us today but I'll uh, since he's not here I'll talk about him 
you know, Aaron Heller, who's one of my co-hosts on this Hump Day Hangout, is the kind of guy, and, and again, like our other panelists here, uh, I can't nominate anybody because I'm involved in the process. But when you're thinking about somebody, think about somebody like an Aaron Heller who has a career as a career fire officer where he does training, as a part-time instructor for a fire academy, but also was a volunteer training officer and chief officer for years training volunteer firefighters, has written and taught on the national level and started on his side business training firefighters. Um, you know, not everybody may or may not know an Aaron Heller, um, but I do, and I know what he's done and the impact he's had in New Jersey. And, you know, and that would be, I think, a great example of somebody. But it could be that person that I've never heard of, but that's doing that kind of work, that, that's living and being passionate about training every day, that those are the nominations, those are the people we want to see. And not only do we want to see them nominated for this award so they get recognized, but also that also brings their name and what they're working on and what they're doing up to this, you know, panel of people that review these that are involved in events like FDIC and the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. So if they're not teaching at FDIC or not writing for the magazine or not teaching for ISFSI or a member of ISFSI even, now we have that point of contact to uh, grab onto that person and say, hey, why aren't you involved in this or that, and, and give them other opportunities as well. So there's a lot of different benefits to it, not only for the award winner, but for all the nominees. Um, what I wanted to ask next is, you know, training in the fire service has changed quite a bit, and Steve um, sort of alluded to it a little bit that, you know, a lot of our firefighters are now becoming visual learners. Um, since we do have a panel of uh, top instructors from around the country, I would like to ask you guys, what are you seeing that's the biggest change or, or difference in fire training uh, maybe 2016, 2017 compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago? Well, it's, it's been around a while, but the, I mean, the internet, social media, all the, the constant fact checking that can go on, uh, the constant, I mean, I, from an instructor standpoint, everyone's got all the information out there available to them and they can use that information in very positive ways. Uh, they can use that information very poorly, but it's such a great tool. It's such a great thing. We don't have to just experience the fires that we go to or the training that we go to, but you, you can come on a platform like this in a, a hump day hangout and use a freely available piece of software and touch people all over the world, uh, which is amazing. And uh, it keeps getting easier to do uh, certain influence are getting much larger and uh, hopefully it gets used as a tool to bring us all together um, in a way that that we're all getting better in the fire service collectively yeah I would I would think um, the decentralization of learning is what I would if I had to give it some kind of title or something that that, that feels like what it is you know it used to be you had to go through your training officer and through your instructor to get information and, and it, like Steve said, the internet changed that. It, it decentralized it. So now I can, I can go to a wide variety of resources and get information. And I think that's what, like you've noticed, uh, the society is working on that now. That's what I see from, from the you know old crazy old past president guy in the corner over here is noticing the society starting to try to work with that, right? To to try to, try to handle this decentralization and ensure that the content you do find is of quality. So. It's an interesting thing from an instructor, instructional standpoint um, that all there is pretty much to know in, in humankind is in your pocket. All you got to do is ask, ask for it. And then how can that be leveraged in some way? Uh, it, it, it would be, I, I would find it difficult being, uh, you know, kind of not in the classroom as much in a traditional sense anymore. Uh, the prepared outline is kind of a thing of the past. Right, you know, I mean, it's it's you don't just whip out the oh let me let me go get the I would go get the slides off the shelf, get the outline off the shelf, and go teach ladders. Well, that's a, no, but that's not that's not current. You know, you have to you have to. There's so much more information. Uh, the the information is no longer centralized to my bookshelf. It's all over the place, and we have to. A young instructor has to be able to to handle that and, and work through it gracefully. So Eddie, as a young 
firefighter, young instructor, you know, my first go-to resource was always the essentials book, you know, the ISA manual or whatever tra training manual the state used. What do you think the go-to is now? You know, if you, if you assign a lieutenant today to teach a class, wh where are they going to go first? Um, depending on the topic, that most of them are going to, they're going to look at their state or whatever their local curriculum is. They're going to hit Google and, and search that topic. And uh, if it's anything to do with, with firefighting uh, operations, they could probably hit uh, the UL website and this website. And, uh, and you have to go shopping, basically, to figure out, you know, what information is, is, is available, of that information, what is accurate and current, and, and of that, what applies to us. So it's a, it's a pretty broad uh, landscape they have to work against now for, you know, the young guys coming up. And, I, you know, that's why I'm like, some of the stuff, the uh, stuff we've been working on lately with society to, to try to give that some sort of structure, I, th I think, is important work. Yeah. Absolutely. Pete? Yeah, I think um, it's the information age, but the challenge for instructors now is, is helping to give that context. Um, because people want their facts and sound bites now, and a lot of the facts that we have to digest, um, sound, bite, sound bites don't quite cut it. Uh, so if we're if we're just um, providing information, uh, as Eddie pointed out, and Steve, the students can get the information on their own. They don't need us for information anymore. What they need us for is context. Uh, how do I how do I fit that information into what I'm doing or not? Doing? Um, one of the things that I, I find striking, and it's just my age, uh, but I always ask classes that I teach, who, who knows who Francis Brannigan was? And usually most of the students never heard of him. And then who knows who Lloyd Lehman was? And most of the students never heard of him. And I'll use a couple other examples, but I always use those too. And I say that if you don't, haven't read their work and you don't understand their work, then you're not prepared for all this new stuff that you're seeing on the internet and you all say and all that stuff. Because that is still the foundation of our job. And so we understand, our guys, our generation of guys knew those books because that's all we had available. So that's what we learned from. Um, students today have so much more that they skip by that because, well, that's old stuff and they want to go to the new stuff. And so part of the challenge for us as instructors is to help them understand that that's part of the context of understanding what's happening today is to know the foundation that that was built on. Francis Brannigan taught us how to look at a building the way a firefighter should look at a building. Nobody thought of that before Brannigan. So outside of the facts in his book is that way of looking, that way of thinking. Lehman was very much the same way, and Lehman was one of the first people, at least in our reachable history, that applied science and engineering and research to the fire service in a way that became tangible, right? And then he put it into a book for application on the fire ground. And so that foundational work is critically important. So um, I think one of the challenges, the opportunity and the challenge for us as instructors today is to, is to be able to bring those things together and help the student understand that that continuity of learning is critically important, not just the fact that you can grab off the internet in the middle of the instruction period. That's a great point, Pete, and I, I think we often forget about that foundation or those of us that had it um, and have those books take it for granted that we have that book and everybody else would have that same information and I think we're probably seeing now that a lot of people don't uh, or don't even know what we're talking about and um, it's funny even Lloyd Lehman I heard about him relatively late in my career and the way I got his book is I had to go to eBay and and buy it off somebody um, but it's a it's a good resource to have and a good book to have in the library and and uh, I've lent his book out and others to people all the time. And I think Frank Brannigan, you know, obviously we all know he's the grandfather of building construction of the fire service. And um, But again, th there seems to be this gap we have today where that, that some of that foundation was lost. And I think, you know, partially because of the Internet age and that sort of thing and, and everything being at people's fingertips. Um, so, you know, maybe a takeaway from this whole hump day hangout is getting back into some of the books. Um and because uh, they're still a great resource as well. So one thing that popped out to me or I noticed as we were talking is um, I had the opportunity to review the nominations for all of you and um, 
one thing in common, and it wasn't intentional why we, I brought you on today, but all three of you at some point in your career as an instructor got involved in fire dynamics, some of you more than others. Um, some of you, it's your primary role in life. Um, others, um, you just kind of took a stab at it and, and off the freight train went. I just thought it was unique that we have three past Instructor of the Year award winners, and um, none of you were nominated for your specifically because of fire dynamics or that sort of thing. But um, if you could talk a little bit about how the fire dynamics, the science age, if you will, of firefighter training has changed in the last couple of years, um, you know, and how it's impacting what you do as an instructor and what we're doing as a fire service leading instruction forward. You know, what, what's the next step? Steve, you got to start. Yeah, what, what's this fire yeah. dynamics you speak of? Uh, I'm not, not familiar. You <laughs> fill, fill me in. Uh, it's uh, uh, we look at fire dynamics and and the reason that fire dynamics is so important to everything else is essentially that is our common language. Um, when you start looking at the fire service as a whole, you look at the thirty thousand plus fire departments we have. You look at all of the different demographics we have. You look at all the different target areas and target hazards and everything that we have in our response areas. And ultimately, none of us can have a conversation about fire unless we understand fire dynamics. I mean, it's 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 the common language. I mean, it, it that is our um, mode of communication, our baseline, the way we discuss anything that has to do with tactics or strategies or anything else. If you don't understand fire, if you don't know how it grows and spreads, I mean, that that is the given, and it's the it. It doesn't have feelings. Uh, it does it, it doesn't care where it is. It doesn't know where it is. It's not alive, and it's very predictable. So if we can get that squared away, much like Francis Brannigan said that about building construction, it's know, know your enemy. Um, well, you've got to understand fire, and then you've got to be able to put it in the building, and you've got to understand how those two things work together. And that's our problem. And... If we understand that problem, then what we do to deal with that problem is fairly straightforward uh, in the grand scheme of things, but there's a ton of gray area in the context that Pete spoke about. It's, it's all about knowing why, and uh, when you know why, you can come up with a game plan and execute it effectively, and I mean, that's why I think a lot of this always comes back to that, is because it's, it's rules, I mean, it's physics. So we can build from there. Pete, ready? Yeah, I was, I was, you know what? The biggest thing it did for me was made me think. You know, I was, I was kind of the attitude that you, okay, get on scene, run around the building real fast, and go in the front door. That was, that was the extent of my thought about it, right? And it caused me to slow down and, and let me think about what's going on. And, and as Steve said, answer the question of why. Why am I going to the front door? You know, is that the right place to go? Is there some other place to go? So. <clears throat> It really made me uh, think about things, and then kind of once I started to think about it, started to ask that question, why, then you start to, um, you know, there's some things we were doing that were great, and then there were some things we were doing that we needed to revisit, and, uh, and then try to figure out how to, how to implement this stuff at a department level was, was a challenge. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's one of those, I, I would classify it as a life-changing event, when I first became aware of what the deep, you know, what specifically we were talking about and realizing how little I knew about it. It was, like, it was scary, man. I had three hours of fire behavior in, in the basic academy, you know, and I I'd, I'd started taking some construction classes and things like that because I intuitively knew I didn't know what I was doing and uh, needed to learn more about it. But th this was a whole new level, you know, to really get in inside the, the, the physics of what's going on inside of a burning building where, uh, it, it was amazing. I, I, you don't realize how lucky you are that uh, you didn't screw it up before now. You know <laughs> that that we made it this far. So so somebody's looking out for me, I guess. And now look, when you know better, do better, right? So that that's kind of the impact it had on me. Cool. He, yeah. You know, I I went to uh, quite by accident. I went to a technical high school. 
So I went to Lane Tech High School in Chicago, and that's so my days were filled with shop and math and science and engineering and those kind of things. And so that part of the job always appealed to me. That was where my strengths were, if you will. And um, so, and I have this really clear memory coming right out of, uh, right after I got out of drill school and I'm on the job and our, our company was down at the shops having our rig replaced and I got an IFSTA book with me and I'm trying to pass my firefighter three. That was the next thing I had to do. And some, you know, old salty guy walks by and says, put the book away, kid. All you need is balls and water. You know, I never saw anybody put a fire out by throwing books at it. And to this day, I wish I could find that guy because I want to wave all the books that I read in front of him and say, I put out all kinds of fires by throwing these books at him. You know, Norman's book, Brannigan's book, Lehman's book. Um, so it always had an appeal to me. And then when the opportunity through what NIST has been doing and, and you all over the last 10 years to, to maximize that, right, and to really take advantage of that and to put it back at the forefront of the fire service where it belongs, I think it's, it's just been this, this glorious way right out the end of my career. Uh, my dad started in the, on the job in Chicago in 1959, and if you put that in context with Brannigan and Lehman and all that, he began his career when all of that work was coming to fruition. And so this really isn't new. This is we're rediscovering our roots, is the way I look at this, and. And so it's just having that opportunity to where layman is relevant again, Brandigan is relevant again, books, science, engineering is relevant, not, not for the first time, but again, because we've rediscovered that this is the foundation of our job. Our job is a technical job. It's a job based on science and engineering, always has been. And to, to be a little piece of that rediscovery has just been the greatest, greatest part of my career, really has Sorry, I lost my I lost my place on my notes. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting here writing away. So, as we get to the top of the uh, the hour here, we did get one question from Twitter uh, that I'd like to throw to the panel. Where does the panel see fire service instruction ten years from now, and what may or may not change? And I think that's an interesting question. Obviously, I think technology is going to come up, but you know, when I started in the fire service, we were still using slides that came in a tray. And then we went to slides being PowerPoint. Now there's talk of going away from from those visual uh, type presentations and and doing it different ways. What, what are your thoughts? Training in ten years from now? I'll tell you. I, I think that the physics won't change. The technology will, right? So we'll we'll, we'll come up with new ways to uh, to, to dis distribute the information. You know that that will evolve. But I think. Uh, I think you know the physics will be the same, but we will be chasing a ever-changing enemy. Uh, with that being in the fuels that we're dealing with and the construction methods, uh, that will always be evolving, and and we'll have to. That's where we use the technology and the, to to figure out what physics apply and how do we how do we adjust our tactics. I, I don't know. They keep trying. I don't know if they're gonna. They're almost getting to the point that. I'm not even sure what to what to do with this structurally. You know, once this structure is exposed, so. It'll be an interesting thing over the next 10 years to see how technology helps us uh, talk about the science. Yeah, I'll chime in. I, uh, I think, and I don't even know if this is really the current term anymore, but the, the idea of the flipped classroom where the student prepares prior to showing up you know, with the instructor is going to become a bigger, bigger part of how we deliver content. And that's going to be for economic reasons and, and all kinds of other things. And because that's where technology, I think, is leading us, is that you're going to tell the student, go out and learn this stuff on your own, and then come apply it with me as your guide, your mentor, your instructor. Uh, it's a piece of what we've always done, but it's going to become that much bigger a piece, I think. Uh, a lot more is going to, uh, a, lot of, a lot more of the burden is going to be put on the student. You're not going to come to my class to learn. You're going to go out and learn and come to my class to get context, to get guidance, to get support. And, you know, more of a Socratic method of instruction is going to take over. Um, I, I just think it's inevitable. That's, that's how people are going to learn up to the point that we get them. So we need to be prepared to continue that. If we want to use a traditional method of instruction to somebody that's already had 16 or 20 years of something very different. So we got to be paying attention to what's going on in the grade schools and the high schools because that, that's how they learn. And we can't expect them to adjust to us. We have to adjust to them. 
So if you want to know what's going to happen 10 years from now, take a look at what's going on in the grade schools, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, I see a huge challenge that we have to tackle is that building on what, what both Eddie and, and Chief Van Thorpe said, it's, it's along the lines of there's so much that you need to know now, and yet we keep trying to cram it in the same block of hours that we had from the beginning. And something's got to give. Um, we've got to layer our training somehow, uh, which is really difficult to do because your first fire is not any safer or less intense than your hundredth fire uh, 20 years into your career. So how do you prepare people for who knows what? I mean, it, all the new technologies. I mean, it, the house fire is one thing, and then we're layering on hazmat, EMS, being nice to each other, uh, all of this stuff that you need to know that everyone's going to expect you to be an expert in, and then you start throwing in building houses out of different stuff, or wind turbines, or energy storage systems, or tall wood buildings. All, all of these hazards keep evolving, and pretty much we're just going to keep adding chapters to training books, or take all the articles from Fire Engineering Magazine and keep adding them all up. It's like, all right, you need to know all of this from the last... 150 years and okay suck all this into your head and then operate perfectly at a electric vehicle fire into a green hospital underneath uh, some spaceship or something like that and it's like how how do you become proficient at all of this so that you can execute when you need to execute and ultimately how do we do all of this when we have no continuing education system that's formalized I mean, this is another thing that's, that drives me nuts, is that the, we all understand that our education needs to evolve and we need to know more, and there's no requirements put in place. And the hours available to do training keep getting cut, and it's, uh, it's a hell of a battle that there, there's got to be some sort of paradigm shift here. Something's got to break, because uh, the, the current system of instruction, I think, is uh, not going to hold up over time. Very well said. I, I, you know, two things that popped into my brain when I saw that question and I listened to three of you is uh, two observations I made just in the last couple of weeks. One was we recently had the ISFSI fall conference in Cincinnati, and um, two of the best presentations done, uh, one had no PowerPoint. Um, the, the instructor just taught, asked questions, gave examples, got people out of their chairs a little bit and, and interacting with him while he did his lecture. And the other one used three slides, basically to set the stage for what he was going to talk about next. And I thought it was interesting because we're seeing, from an instructor society standpoint, we're seeing and hearing more and more about, um, you know, less PowerPoint, less visual aids, even though, you know, everybody's going, and more teaching, getting back to, um you know, instructors sharing their experiences, their knowledge, uh, and that sort of stuff. And I agree with what Pete talked about, the flipped classroom. Uh, that model seems to be spreading uh, throughout the industry. And, and I can tell you, my kids, I, I still have one in elementary school, and where they're heading is no books. You know, they're going to get a tablet computer, and everything they do, their books, their homework, their tests, their state tests, everything's going to be on a tablet computer and they, you know, come in and they, on Friday they download all their work for the week and on Monday the teacher loads all the new information for the following week. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch where all that goes and with technology changing. And then the other one that I think is interesting that I've just noticed today actually, um, in our state of Ohio they just issued um, the training calendar for 2017 for the state fire marshal's office and the state academy. And for years, we've been adding hours to firefighter one and two, adding hours to instructor, inspector, all the different certification courses. We've been adding hours as we've added more content, more topics. Um, and then especially on the EMS side, we've seen the paramedic program go from uh, a couple of months part-time to being pretty much a full-time college program that takes over a year to complete. But what I've seen recently and I find is interesting 
is now a lot of places are offering accelerated learning options. And I saw this probably become popular five to ten years ago at the college level where a lot of colleges and universities were marketing to uh, adult people that were already in the workforce accelerated college degree programs where you know you could get your bachelor's done in two years well now they're, they're offering a paramedic program 40 hours a week paramedic program you're done in six months and uh, I just think it's interesting it's just an observation that you know maybe it's something we need to watch um, when we're looking at what higher learning is doing and what we're what our kids are learning in in elementary school uh, I think it's going to be some mix of this technology, this flipped classroom, but also that immediate need. People people want to get things done quickly. They don't want to be told it's going to take them, you know, a year and a half to become a paramedic. And here we now in Ohio we have a paramedic accelerated paramedic program uh, where you can go full time and be done in six months as opposed to fourteen or fifteen months. That's the traditional method. So I think those are all interesting and and some of the things we're going to see moving forward over the next ten years. Um, believe it or not, we're already uh, headed to the top of the hour, um, so I did want to refocus just for a minute on our original topic, which is the George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award. Uh, nominations are being accepted now. You can download the nomination form from Fire Engineering's website. Uh, it's actually in the magazine this month and next month, uh, or go to isfsi.org the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. We have the nomination form on our website. Fill it out, send it in. Uh, it's got to be in by the end of the year. December 31st is the cutoff. And uh, hopefully one of you that's listening to this show, watching the show today, may be the next George D. Post Instructor of the Year. Um, before we completely wrap, I just want to let uh, our guests uh, a final word on the topic. And uh, just once again, thank you all for coming on here today. Thanks for having us, man. I, I, I'll, I'll just say this to any, when you make a nomination, tell us a story. You know, tell us about the impact they had. Give us, give us something that we can understand um, about the impact this person's had on their, on their community, their fire service. I mean, that, that really helps us a lot. And good luck to all the nom nominees. Take the time. I mean, in, I mean, it sounds simple, but. You, you got to nominate these folks. Uh, I mean, we're, we're not going out and finding them. Uh, you've got to bring them to us. So please, please take the time and and uh, get it submitted. And and hey, if you if you get selected or don't get selected, have a conversation with the person that you nominated as well. Let them know you nominated them. Let them know why, and uh, have that conversation. That's a great point. Thank you. So much. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, please introduce us to somebody we don't know. And introduce the American Fire Service to somebody they don't know. Uh, and I'd really like to see that happen. Great points. So again, nominate your Instructor of the Year. Uh, go to fireengineering.com or isfsi.org. And uh, you know, tell us a story. Tell us about that person. And I think all three just brought up a great point that you know, regardless of who you're nominating and whether or not that person wins, let those people know that you appreciate them, that you like what they're doing, that you uh, enjoy learning from them or seeing what they're doing. And uh, all of us have a have an obligation to be that mentor, that supporter, that person that is is pushing someone to do more. You know, grabbing them by the collar, getting them to write an article, getting them to teach a class, whatever the case may be. Uh, we all, in order to make the fire service a better place, have that obligation, and we owe it to uh, our students and our instructors to fill that role. So, again, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you for watching the Hump Day Hangout. We'll be back again next month, the first Wednesday of the month, talking about training. Until then, be safe. <laughs>